1430 over Zaporizhia, 10 FPV drones began their workday. Each had been airborne for two minutes. Their 6S 2200 milliamp hour LiPo batteries were essentially fist-sized gas tanks, giving them a total flight time of eight minutes, enough to cause trouble, not enough to make it home for breakfast. This was a one-way ticket. Their payload, a 2.6 kilogram PG 7VL warhead. This isn't a huge, deafening explosion. It's a syringe of molten copper plasma moving at 8,000 meters per second, designed specifically to punch through thick steel. The operators didn't know that 40 kilometers away, an alarm had just been raised. A stationary Podlet K-1 radar system, basically a high-tech neighborhood watch whose job is to notice small things sneaking under the fence, detected a cluster of low-flying contacts. That targeting data was immediately sent to the primary electronic warfare asset in the sector, an R330ZH GTEL complex. The GTEL is the electronic bully on the block. Within 90 seconds, it turned its music to full volume, right on the 915 megahertz command frequency. This is a brute force electronic attack, the equivalent of trying to have a serious conversation while standing right next to a rock concert speaker. For four of the 10 operators, the party was over. Their video feeds were still clear, but the control sticks in their hands suddenly felt like unconnected plastic toys. The command link was severed. The vaunted fail-safe systems were completely paralyzed. Four drones, now deaf and dumb, fell uncontrollably. 40% of the attack team had just taken early retirement. The remaining six operators didn't panic. Protocol took over. The only option was to hug the ground. The drone's altitude was dropped from 15 meters to just 3 meters off the ground. Flying 140 kilometers per hour that close to the terrain is essentially a game of chicken with every tree and fence post, but it worked. The contours of the earth and vegetation became makeshift shields. The shaky command link stabilized. A general warning was sent over the opposing radio network. The locomotive engineer on the target train received the message and predictably pushed the throttle further. The heavy cargo train accelerated from 55 kilometers per hour to 65 kilometers per hour. That small acceleration changed the entire calculation. The six remaining drones had to break off their straight line paths and fly wider pursuit curves, burning precious battery as if there were no tomorrow. The six remaining drones reached a distance of eight kilometers from the moving target. At a rail junction ahead, a stationary TOR-M2 short-range air defense system, a $25 million bug zapper, activated its tracking radar. The TOR-M2 system is a specialist. It doesn't mess around with cannons. It only launches missiles. Its tracking radar locked on, and two 9M338 missiles shot vertically from their launchers. It was brutal efficiency. Two drones vanished in small fireballs. The tour launched again. A third drone was obliterated. Six was now three. The operators of the three remaining drones didn't flinch. No complex sacrificial maneuvers. These pilots knew the specs. The only move was full throttle, straight at their killer, the Tor M2 crew frantically tried to reacquire, but it was too late. The three drones had breached the 1,500 meter mark. They had just entered the Tor's dead bubble. The $25 million system had no cannons. Its missiles couldn't maneuver or arm themselves at that close range. The Tor M2, the specialist, had just become the most expensive spectator on the battlefield defeated by its own technical specifications. The final three drones were now clear on their target. Suddenly, the Jetel tried one more time, a desperate throw. The EW asset flooded the 5.8 gigahertz video frequency. The operator's goggle screens turned to static snow. 10 seconds of flight time remaining, the operators were now flying blind. 
relying on muscle memory and the last, image memory. All three pilots stabilized their axis, pushed the throttle to 100%, and locked their control sticks. They were essentially throwing a $500 bowling ball down a pitch black alley, hoping from memory where the pins were. The first drone, tasked with separation, hit its mark right on the coupling between the locomotive and the first car. A precision strike. The locomotive was disconnected, now speeding off alone, completely unaware that the rest of its train had just been orphaned on the tracks. Two seconds later, an eternity for the pilot staring at static, the second drone arrived. It punched into the first ammunition car, its PG-7VL warhead tearing through the steel as if it were just tinfoil on yesterday's leftovers. The door had been kicked down. One crucial second passed. The third drone, the closer, slammed into the second ammunition car. No longer to pierce, but to ensure this was the final nail in the coffin. An observation drone, orbiting from a safe distance of 15 kilometers, recorded what happened next. A sympathetic detonation tore through the train cars. The ammunition cars didn't explode one by one. They simply ceased to exist in a single massive flash. The pressure wave then ripped the steel rails from their sleepers as if they were cheap party decorations, tossing them aside and leaving a gaping crater. All that remained was a large, deep hole where a critical supply line used to be. No train would be passing through there again for a very, very long time. The lesson of the day was brutal and deeply ironic. Spending tens of millions of dollars on advanced radar, powerful EW assets, and sophisticated Tor M2 missile systems to defend a piece of rail, turned out to be like hiring a fully armed SWAT team to guard a plate of cookies in your kitchen. It was a spectacular waste. Those systems were designed to fight one large, high-performance threat. They had absolutely no idea what to do when 10 persistent $500 flies kicked in the door. Watch your six.